Our first speaker will be Gregory Baum, who's Emeritus Professor of Religious Studies at McGill University, um, who's written an important book about Polanyi's uh, ethics. Uh, um, the, the next uh, presentation will be by Peter Brown, Professor at the School of Environment, Department of Geography at McGill University. That is, uh, his co-author is John Erickson, Professor of Ecological Economics at the Rubenstein School of Environment uh, at the University of Vermont. Uh, they will be followed by Michele Tangiani, um, Professor, Department of Philosophy and Cultural Heritage at the University of Cagliari in Italy. Uh, the next um, presenter will be Alicia Heron, researcher at the Institute for Economic Research at the Universidad Nacional Autónoma de Mexico. Um, and then the final speaker, um, who's also known to you as Sidney Greenfield, Emeritus Professor of Anthropology at the University of Wisconsin. So we're going to um, have the very tight discipline of 15 minutes apiece, and uh, so we will have some time uh, for discussion. And we are going to end very promptly because um, the next and last um, presentation of the day will be the movie, which is uh, across the street. And so we have to allow time to um, get to our places at the movie theater across the street. Uh, I've got there. That's right. Sorry, I don't know if you said this, but I was just told we should be out of here 10 past 5 in order to get it. We're a big gang, so we have to get there on time. Because we have elevators. Yes. Elevators and stairs. So we work backwards, and 10 after 5 is when we should be passing this. Okay, so um, with no further ado, I'd like to introduce Professor Bow. <laughs> I want to begin by saying how happy I, how happy I am to be present at this uh, Kapolanyi conference. Uh, this for me is a celebration of the achievement of Margie Mandel and uh, Kari Levitt, uh, who founded this institute, a center of critical thinking and research uh, into, in Montreal and in, in the world and making available online the archives of, uh, of Polanyi. So for me, this is a celebration. Uh, my talk, very briefly, uh, I discovered uh, that the commentators on the Pope Francis rejection of capitalism uh, have suggested that this is not the influence of Marxism, but of Karl Polanyi. A number of authors have said this. And so I wrote a paper, a 20-page paper, in which I explore the similarity between the social theories and interpretations of Capolani and uh, Pope Francis. Uh, uh, the first part deals with the ethics of Polanyi. I think the article in The Atlantic that made this brief comparison said that both Francis and uh, Polanyi are concerned with ethics and with culture and this was not true of scientific Marxism for whom ethics and culture is part of the superstructure and do not really enter into this uh, uh, <coughs> into this picture um, so the first section is about the ethics of Polanyi which is very central for him uh, the evolution of the ethics in Catholic social teaching the second part compares their critique of the unregulated market system, which is, has similarities. The third part uh, is how they see uh, any possible changes. Uh, is there a counter-movement? Is there an activity that, uh, promised, that has promised for the future? And the fourth section is uh, that both of them advocate the cooperation of religious and secular people in a common struggle uh, for solidarity and justice. So these are the four sections. I would say a few words first about the, the ethics of Polanyi. He wrote about this when he was very young in Vienna and later when he lived in England. And he had a tremendous sense that we as human beings are ethical beings 
and he gives a phenomenological <coughs> argument. He argues all of us in our daily life want to be related fairly and ethically to our neighbor, and we want to be treated ethically and decently by our neighbor. This is a profound conviction. I mean, the same argument is given by Habermas, of course, many generations later, who argues very much against uh, the scientists who are increasingly arguing that our behavior is deterministic. That is, they argue that there is a, an interaction of psychological and physiological laws that are operative in our action. And Habermas, uh, if you like, following uh, Polanyi, says that the scientist who has this view in his office when he does his research and writing, when he goes home, uh, he is cross with his children because they are disobedient and he prays that the children who do what he wants and so he really assumes that they are free agents and that the blame and praise is the proper attitude and so Polanyi then argues we, we are free beings, we have freedom. Uh, he was very conscious of the kind of creativity that is hidden in us. In one of her essays Margie Mandel writes that uh, Polanyi didn't want to use the word, I uh, didn't refer to people who were oppressed as oppressed people because he felt if you call them oppressed, you don't, you disguise the fact that they remain creators and have constantly new ideas of how to survive and how to find alternatives and solutions. Uh, Polanyi believed that this conscience uh, the conscience, that we are people of conscience, and he said the conscience in modern society is a civic conscience, das bürgerliche Gewissen, that is, we are responsible not only for our own lives, but for the lives, for society as a whole. And he argues that this is the achievement of modern society, <coughs> uh, even though it is religiously based. He believes, he talks about the teaching of Jesus, the personal conscience, in fact, already founded in the Older Testament. And in modern society, this has been created, uh, the uh, civic conscience. And he makes a remark which I have found very uh, interesting and moving. And he says the civic conscience uh, created by modern society cannot be satisfied in democracy as long as it is linked to capitalism. And therefore, there is something that we are inevitably restless in this society. It creates in us a conscience that can't be satisfied within it. Uh, now, what is interesting is that within Catholicism, I mean, Catholicism in the 19th century and early 20th century rejected modernity, rejected modernity, rejected uh, democracy, uh, human rights, uh, religious liberty, and so on, separation of church and state. Uh, but in the 30s, a few years after Polanyi began to write, there were French authors, Catholic authors, uh, Jacques Maritain and Emmanuel Mounier, who developed an ethic that was very similar. They said, we don't want liberalism, we don't want individualism on the one hand, we don't want collectivism uh, uh, that uh, is promoted by communism, uh, we want... Uh, uh, the understanding of a person that is uh, in community and is responsible for community and is nourished by community and therefore there is a social dimension in the person and so he, they too developed an ethic that is often called personalism and that is very close to uh, Polanyi. What is interesting to me is that when Polanyi went to England he worked with the Christian left at that time and among them was a Scottish philosopher, McMurray, John McMurray, who developed what he called an ethic of persons in community. And he wrote this with two hyphen, persons hyphen in hyphen community. Uh, and this was very much what, uh, what uh, Polanyi uh, wrote about uh, in, in Vienna. I mean, I remember this spelling because in the 19, I'm an old man, in the 1940s I was a member of the student Christian movement and we used, we used text from uh, McMurray and so I remember person hyphen in hyphen community. 
So there is this affinity. Uh, I better watch. Uh, we don't have much time. Uh, I will shut up in a minute. Uh, I want to say that both uh, uh, Polanyi and Francis uh, offers a critique of uh, uh, liberal capitalism or neoliberal capitalism, uh, which is cultural. And therefore, they had, uh, this is quite different from the scientific Marxism, where uh, workers are simply regarded as exploited. However, the early writings of Marx, the Paris manuscripts, these wonderful <coughs> documents of the alienation of labor, uh, Polanyi didn't know this, of course. This was only published in the 30s, and in, again in the writings of Margie Mandel, I saw that he then changed his view about Marxism because he read these early documents. And while I cannot, I cannot document this, but I'm sure that John Paul II and the present Pope, in their critique of uh, capitalism, cultural critique, uh, there is, I'm sure they must have read uh, this, these Paris documents of Marx because this is an extraordinary breakthrough and he describes what happens to workers in the factory system uh, which is a critique of course both of industrial capitalism and the industries in the Soviet bloc uh, were of course uh, equally damaging uh, to workers because they were in no sense subjects uh, of production, they were objects of production. Uh, so there is a similarity again between the critique and just one word, there is uh, a similarity, of course Polanyi had this famous, um, uh, this famous theory of the counter-movement, of the counter-movement is coming, the Pope uh, Francis uh, is not that definite but believes it is important uh, for popular movements to struggle and to gain power, to gain influence. Just a few days ago, uh, Francis had invited representatives of the popular movements of Latin America uh, and Africa and Asia to come to Rome. Uh, he spent three days with them. He gave an extraordinary talk um, uh, in which he promoted the social economy that is poor people have to learn to rely on themselves, to be inventive, to stick together, to be in solidarity, to demand to be heard, and we need a form of democracy beyond the one that we have in which uh, the excluded can participate. And he argues that when, the, when they can participate, the, the torrent of energy that they bring uh, will be able to change society for the better. Thank you. Thank you for your brevity. You'll be rewarded at the discussion time. Uh, our next uh, paper will be by Peter Brown and John Erickson. Uh, thank you. Uh, so I want to uh, thank uh, Anna, Margie, and Carrie for including uh, John and myself in this uh, wonderful event. And um, we're, uh, we are fortunate to be cooperating on a new venture called Economics for the Anthropocene. And we're looking for some great <coughs> PhD students. If you've got any, send them our way. And uh, if you don't like this talk, don't send them. <laughs> um, so um, we're going to, there's a couple of metaphors I'd like to just get on the table uh, quickly uh, to help to explain the, the talk. I've only got seven or eight minutes because John and I are splitting this. So uh, <clears throat> one, one metaphor is from the movie uh, The Magic Christian by Peter Sellers. Uh, where he's the richest man in the world and he's traveling uh, on a, he's having a board meeting on a train and all his companies are failing and so forth and so he, um, he has the train stop and he has all his board members get off, he fires them and then as each of them gets off the train he hands them a, a, a map but none of them are maps of where they are, right? They're just random maps downtown Auckland, you know, you know, you know Cleveland, Ohio, places like that and um, so that's what we do in universities. Right. Um, you know, you know, when when you um, walk across the stage and you get the so-called parchment, uh, in a large part, it's not a map of where you are. So, so it's um, one of our theses is that that uh, higher education actually impedes the exercise of liberty, the exercise of freedom, and also uh, we want to make a pretty radical critique of the liberal understanding of freedom. 
Uh, so I'll. Uh, so this is, uh, I hope now, a famous quote uh, concerning the Anthropocene. I mean, our basic point is that we have thought systems that are left over from a different period. Uh, we, we're in a new uh, human-planet relationship, and higher education hasn't really adjusted to this, uh, except at the margins, and that, that it's kind of an urgent problem uh, to get this, get this straightened out. Um, so um, what, we're, uh, what we're concerned about is really how do humans uh, fit into the universe, and uh, what, what, how do we uh, think about what fresh understandings we have over the last uh, 200 years, but particularly since World War II, would say about how we think about ourselves and uh, what, what we should do. Um, so, so there are at least um, uh, there are two kind of worldviews in, in sort of in contest now, if you like. Um, although the recent uh, announcement from the Vatican about the accepting the Big Bang Theory, which I thought was a hoax, but maybe it wasn't. Um, maybe there's a little bit more convergence than I thought. But uh, on the one hand, there's the Judeo-Christian Muslim worldview and with sort of Greek and Enlightenment sources. Um, uh, Carolyn Merchant's uh, very excellent book, Reinventing Eden, is a, really a terrific interpretation of this. Um, and then um, there's another, uh, well, this, this is a, obviously just a graphic uh, picture of this, of some elements of this worldview, man created in the, in the image of God. Yeah, women being subordinate and derivative of men, and then, of course, the fall, which not only casts us out of paradise, but also degrades uh, the world. And the um, se second worldview is uh, basically the scientific uh, synthesis of uh, the last 500 years, and um, so we, we think that much of higher education is anchored in the first of these worldviews, not in the second, and that this is a, a source of systematic trouble. We're working uh, with, um, in our partnership uh, that we have, we're working with Macquarie University in Sydney with David Christian and we're, we're sort of uh, building up an element into our program that, that assumes uh, or, or argues for the correctness at least of the Big Bang Theory and the, and the ultimate uh, uh, sort of uh, trappings that go with that. It's not a perfect theory, it doesn't answer a number of questions, I don't want to go into that right now but I can do that in a question period. And uh, so we're in a universe of, of continuous creation, uh, and what we need to do in higher education is to, uh, is to take this on board. So um, I want to just now make my uh, second point um, that we, we misunderstand freedom in a very profound way, uh, and that we should uh, extend Polanyi's question to, from uh, freedom in a complex society to the question of freedom in a complex universe. Right, and we haven't, we haven't crossed over into a real exp exploration of the ecological, evolutionary, and biophysical features of uh, human life. Uh, so um, the, the meaning of freedom in a complex universe is Jefferson believed in a deterministic uh, universe um, based on Newtonian physics and believed in Christian deism. Um, but uh, we don't, at least, I don't. I think most people don't believe um, either of those premises anymore. Uh, and if you look at the first and second laws of thermodynamics and you try to connect these to the current understanding of liberty, uh, you come up with a pretty sickening result um, because um, first law of thermodynamics says energy and matter are conserved. The earth is close to, to matter, so when we drive our cars into traffic jams every morning in Montreal, uh, we kill people in other parts of the world. Um, and we also are using up the, the uh, rare uh, <clears throat> and low entropy materials uh, such as fossil fuels that are necessary to support the Haber-Bosch process. Right, so there's a very profound problem with liberty in, a, in our society. And what we've uh, explored in this project is that uh, to look at uh, something like liberty as, a, as an example of, a, of what we've come to call an orphan discipline a discipline who's, uh, which is alive in pedagogy and practice, but whose parents are dead. Um, so it's my argument I'm giving here, obviously it's very complex, that, that, that the concept of liberty is in fact an orphan, um, and that there are uh, a number of, of other orphans, um, which are, in, in, our, in our view at least, at least the following five normative disciplines, economics, finance, law, governance, and ethics. Uh, these are thought systems which are systematically misleading. 
and uh, probably probably the worst and most dangerous one of these is is finance. So I'm John's going to pick it up here. Um, so we'll, we'll pick on just one of the orphans, economics. It's the one I'm most comfortable with, um, rather than take them all on today. Um, and, and a central question of this economics for the Anthropocene project is, you know, are, are we building an, a study of economics and an economy that is built to survive the Anthropocene? Um, there's no question that we live in a human-dominated do planet, and in part that's come from a, 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 a perception of ourselves as the dominators. Um, there are two, two competing views of the economy. Um, the, the, the mainstream view is certainly you know, reflected in just about every introductory economics book on chapter one, page one. Divide the world up into households and firms, goods and services. Um, Polanyi's critique of, of capital and commodification of these things is, is, is certainly um, reflected here. Um, this worldview um, really is not constrained by um, what Peter introduced us to first and second laws of thermodynamics. It's a worldview that fundamentally depends on infinite economic growth, um, a worldview that does indeed commodify labor and, and nature. Um, it's, it's a worldview that um, is meant to uh, dominate the earth, as this picture of the earth at night shows. Um, and this is where we're meant to be heading in this worldview. This is a an advertisement from an in-flight magazine, Alabama Power, always on. So this is the goal, right? <laughs> to complete the domination, to co complete what Peter introduced as the Emancipation Project, to emancipate ourselves from each other, emancipate ourselves from the earth, emancipate ourselves from ourselves. Um, the other competing worldview uh, is, a, is a worldview that, that has become come to be known as ecological economics. I do agree that it's absurd that we have to have a name, ecological economics. The economy is indeed embedded in an ecosystem. The economy is embedded in a social system, which is embedded in an ecosystem is probably the better way to describe that. So this is really, in many ways, extending the, the embedded notions of, of belonging to a vision of humans in the universe, not just humans in society. When we embed the economy in an ecosystem, we get very different results. <laughs> a very different conception of economic relationships with the earth. Um, this is, of course, much more complex than just simply throughput of energy and matter. Um, we can think about the full web of life and where the economy is situated in that full level web of life. And the maintenance of environmental systems that sustain and contain the economic system. And the exploitation, processing, manufacturing, and consumption, and, and ultimately returning low entropy matter and energy to high entropy waste is an unavoidable consequence of those first and second laws of thermodynamics. So what we're trying to do in this project, economics for the Anthropocene, is no less than build a consilient economics, a study of economics that is a jumping together of knowledge from other fields within social sciences and between the social sciences, humanities, and the natural sciences. And we, we borrow this term from E.O. Wilson's book, 1998 book of consilience. And, this, and as we move towards a consilient economics, we're looking for foundational knowledge, if you will, from the natural sciences, from which to build a new social science, from which to build a new humanities. Uh, foundational knowledge that recognizes life and that people, homo sapiens, are one species of many, that we are one primate species, which is one of many social species, which belongs to a genus, a family, an order, a class, a phylum, a kingdom, and a domain. That a view of economics that is consistent across multiple time dimensions, embedded time, if you will, um, from cosmological time, this narrative of big history that David Christian offers, offers us, um, all the way down to neurological, chemical, and atomic time. A view of the economy that is consistent across many, many scales, from the laws of the universe to the, the laws of the individual, and the physical processes of, 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 of the mentality of, of human beings that we find in the brain sciences. So this is by no means complete, but as you imagine a consilient economics, the study of economics therefore has to be consistent with, consilient with, um, behavioral science, ethics, and philosophy, 
as we go up the ladder and con consilient with or consistent with political science, sociology, anthropology, neurosciences, life sciences, earth sciences, and physics. An embedding, if you will, of the social system and the study of the social system built on a foundation of our natural systems. To do otherwise um, in the Anthropocene is dangerous. So um, when, when, when you do this, we, we can imagine two very, very contrasting worldviews. Um, one might call, on the left column, the neoclassical economic worldview. Um, certainly the neoliberal, neoliberalism that this conference is kind of, its critique is built around, is an expression of that worldview. Humans as these species, environment as resource, technology as exogenous, not part of a social process. The marginal unit is the unit of analysis. The pr primacy of efficiency, Pareto efficiency in particular, as, as our golden rule. This distribution is a, is, is a given in the neoclassical synthesis, right? It's, it's sort of where we start and then we leave it to, to go to Pareto optimality. The substitutability of inputs is, is the kind of primary aspect of the neoclassical model. Um, we can substitute nature for capital and capital for people. Um, the, the, the obsession with equilibrium conditions. Economists have always had physics envy, but as <laughs> physics has evolved um, away from classical physics, uh, we've kind of hung on to those, those, those uh, 18th and 19th century roots and, and progress as deterministic. Whereas the ecological economic worldview, if, if, if you might excuse that phrase, is of course humans as only one species of, of life on Earth. The economy as an embedded subsystem of society and environment. Technology as an endogenous, socially contrived process. The importance of complexity and discontinuity as the unit of analysis, not the marginal unit. The primacy of scale. The big question for the Anthropocene is not how efficient the economy is. It's how big is the economy relative to the sustaining and containing social and ecological systems. Distribution as a goal instead of as a given. The complementary of inputs, complementarity of inputs. The first and second law of thermodynamics simply says that you cannot do something with nothing. You always and everywhere need energy and matter as inputs and will create energy and matter as waste. The realities of disequilibrium in our so embedded e economic, social, and ecological systems, and the importance of a view of coevolutionary change, coevolution of economy, society, and environment on this journey that we find ourselves on. So that's our take on freedom in the Anthropocene. Thank you.
and many authors uh, uh, study this uh, this problem in this period now. It, it will be too, too long to even simply uh, make reference to the name of those persons, but. Uh, the idea is that uh, uh, we have a, a, a very uh, a, a decay of democracy and uh, of liberty in, in the sense that, uh, for, for instance, uh, Mattia Sen, Sen uh, speaks of a positive liberty, a positive freedom, and uh, uh, also, this made many people to uh, reflect uh, in, a, in a deeper uh, way about uh, uh, the structure and the, the dynamics and the future of our society. And also here, the examples are, are, are many, but uh, just to, uh, uh, for instance, beginning with uh, the fact that uh, the, the financialization of the economy uh, has been a, a, uh, has, has been the subject of a book by Magdoff and Sweezy of uh, 1987, Stagnation and Financial Explosion, where uh, the, 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 fact, the, the need to find a new uh, a new uh, way of uh, uh, investing money uh, in a profitable way or uh, augmenting uh, rent, <laughs> not only profit, was, uh, was uh, finance and uh, as well as many other uh, uh, fields, uh, commons, uh, the, the famous idea of uh, extractive capitalism of uh, uh, um, uh, accumulation uh, by disposition. Uh, it is uh, Harvey, David Harvey, uh, who in his book uh, on everybody who speaks of this. <coughs> but um, uh, uh, we, we can say that uh, uh, even, even uh, 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 some very strange concepts, uh, uh, such as uh, the declining rate of profit, uh, have been, uh, have been uh, mentioned, uh, and, uh, and uh, just to try some, some explanation of, of a, a so difficult situation and the apparent uh, impossibility of capitalism to get out of this uh, uh, crisis began in the 70s and never uh, finished. Uh, <coughs> it seems that uh, um, Princess uh, in, uh, in interesting also uh, uh, the fact that in our epoch, uh, differently in, from uh, other epochs of uh, capitalist development, we have also we are also confronted to the ecological problem. I, I don't, don't, don't need to. To, to speak of it, but, but of this, but it is interesting that uh, James O'Connor uh, uh, wrote about the second contradiction of capitalism, the first being the, the uh, systematic uh, tendency to uh, overaccumulation of capital. But uh, uh, the idea uh, by O'Connor is that uh, this uh, 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 second contradiction of, of, of capitalism is the need, uh, which, uh, the cause of this contradiction is the fact that uh, capital uh, has the need to shift costs on its, uh, uh, onto its environment. Um, uh, but uh, the problem is uh, that uh, doing this in the medium long term, this uh, makes uh, uh, costs of production uh, uh, augment, and uh, uh, this uh, provokes a, 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 a further need to shift costs of the environment and so on. We have a runaway process, and, uh, uh, and, and, and this uh, makes uh, uh, us uh, think also uh, about uh, 
uh, the alternative that the two different points of view uh, by two uh, sociologists uh, uh, about the present situation. One is Connie Crouch, uh, who is uh, asking uh, uh, if uh, uh, capitalism can be made fit for society. And he intelligently proposes a, a series of reforms. The problem is uh, that uh, uh, it seems impossible to implement those reforms. And even uh, are missing uh, forces, political, social forces, <coughs> capable of, uh, of uh, implementing that. But maybe a, a, a more uh, general, a deeper reason of this impossibility is that uh, uh, the, the present uh, uh, need of, uh, of capital for uh, uh, find new sources of, uh, of uh, profit and um, uh, makes it uh, in, in, impossible to uh, to uh, uh, spend for uh, it, it makes it. Uh, there is the need to, to, to cut uh, public expenditure, to uh, privatize uh, public uh, enterprises and, uh, and public utilities, also health care and so on. Uh, and, 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 and so this may be there is a, 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 a deeper uh, uh, need for uh, not to do reforms. <laughs> Uh, than uh, simply uh, the, the difficulty to, to find the forces uh, supporting uh, this uh, political change. Uh, uh, and uh, on, on this ground uh, also uh, Wolfgang uh, Streck uh, wrote recently an article uh, uh, which was uh, uh, mentioned also by Enzo Migioni yesterday, if I remember. And, um, and in this case, uh, the, uh, the idea is, uh, in a sense, uh, the opposite. Reforms are, uh, are impossible, and the impossibility of those reforms and uh, of uh, a defensive movement and a, a, a limitation of capitalism and uh, uh, the uh, helping uh, help capitalism to, uh, to rescue itself from itself uh, all this now it seems uh, I I I impossible, but uh, this uh, uh, leads uh, uh, risk to lead to uh, a, a very, di a di very difficult uh, period and maybe to the, the end of capitalism, who, which will collapse by itself. <laughs> <laughs> if if it cannot possibly do so. So this this is a, is a, a, a kind of, of, of progress. Now uh, I almost finished my, my time, and uh, uh, this was uh, only the introduction because the other subject was uh, the, the political <laughs> philosophy of of, of, of Polari, a very a very demanding uh, ideal of a uh, perfectly, perfectly democratic uh, society where uh, every, every individual uh, can be responsible and uh, uh, intelligently responsible, informed, and uh, participate, uh, in, uh, thereby being able to participate to uh, the construction of, of its own society. Because for social uh, freedom, uh, Polani, uh, means uh, uh, precisely the idea that uh, we are really free, not without society or outside society, but uh, uh, within society, and uh, and uh, uh, through a, a, a general collaboration and resp responsibility of every everyone in the construction uh, and there is a solution of society, solution of social problems. And, and, and so on. And uh, this is uh, what, uh, uh, um, this also is a complicated uh, problem. I, I wrote a, a, an article about this, and now it's possible to, to, 
to, to continue on this, but uh, the idea that I have now, I can almost only, only uh, uh, tell you the title of, 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 of my paper or the general subject. It was uh, uh, what kind of, a, of a theoretical support can we find in, in, in Polanyi's writings uh, both to explain the present difficulties of capitalism and, uh, and so larger uh, interest uh, for very deep problems regarding uh, capitalist in our dynamics and the natural, very natural capitalism itself. And on the other, on the other hand, uh, what support can we find in his theory uh, for his, uh, for Polanyi's uh, own, own uh, uh, political uh, philosophy. And uh, the, to, in order to, 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 to uh, reply to those questions, I, I reread The Great Transformation and I, I discovered that uh, I didn't yet uh, 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 understand really what <laughs> it was. Also a new, a new reading and a new understanding. And I think this is maybe is, is a common experience because it's a complex book that it's possible to read and to read and understand it. And, and uh, uh, now it is impossible to... Uh, how, how, how much time? I, have, I think um, three minutes. Three minutes? Oh, okay. <laughs> Uh, okay, I'm sorry, but uh, in any case, if somebody is interested, uh, there is my provisional paper uh, in, in the, the, the site of the key. Uh, 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 no, the uh, idea is that uh, it is possible to read the transformation, finding the, the, uh, uh, a theory of capitalism uh, and the problem of capitalism, the importance of, of, of spinal, and if I. If I <laughs> if I'm allowed to, to <laughs> it is that uh, we have in this case uh, two, a, a problem of a, of a runaway process uh, and uh, a, a, a kind of, of a, an, uh, entropic uh, shift, uh, uh, and uh, because uh, the idea uh, the idea is uh, is what Moran many years ago said. If at uh, a certain moment a, a system uh, trying to solve its own problems uh, uh, realizes that uh, uh, this way uh, problems uh, uh, become worse and worse, that the errors augment instead of being corrected, this means that there is something wrong in the system itself. And, uh, and the rules of the system has to be uh, changed. And it is a little, I think that uh, uh, beyond any end discussion, historical and so on, that are uh, interesting and, and correct, uh, a criticism that uh, Polanyi received about uh, the importance he uh, gave to, to this uh, historical uh, story of Sfina. This, this is the, the reason why he was interested in it was, uh, it was uh, the, the idea that a certain moment, a certain social system cannot uh, continue. And, and when he, he then got, uh, have, uh, also other problems, uh, other, other reasons that uh, why this is very important is that uh, a, a main subject of the real transformation is the formation of the, the labor market. And this means uh, in, in, in Marx term, term uh, a, a new epoch begins when the, the free labor meets the capital. And, and this is, this is the, 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 the main uh, uh, basic uh, and deep characteristic of the system, a free market for labor. And uh, this be, be, began this way. Uh, another another uh, point of interest which is connected with the uh, political theory is uh, uh, the fact that uh, it is in connection with uh, uh, the, 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 the chapter on Spina that, that, that the Polani uh, begins to speak of, of the theme of the discovery of society, which he will deal more, the, more extensively uh, in another chapter. Uh, because uh, the, the, it, was in, it was a moment that society began to uh, uh, reflect on itself. 
and uh, and uh, uh, by the, uh, the old norms, uh, uh, the old <coughs> rules do not function. Uh, what have we to do? Uh, is it on? Uh, uh, it, is it uh, the discovery that society is a problem and is a problem uh, that uh, uh, human beings uh, have to solve by them, themselves? There is no no longer uh, inter interpretations of, of the world uh, to, to make a reference to, to solve our problems, but uh, we, it is up to ourselves uh, to solve our problems and to change our, our, our society. And, and, and this is uh, uh, also uh, very important because uh, and in this connection also the idea of a, of a complex society, but now I have to stop. Uh, but also the idea of the complex society, uh, Polanyi uh, read uh, Robert Lind, uh, 1939, in a book called, uh, called uh, um, uh, Knowledge for What? what? Knowledge, what? knowledge for What? Mm -hmm. uh, and and he, there he defines uh, uh, complexity as uh, uh, the, the chains of, of, of causality in society becomes longer and longer and makes this more and more difficult to control this society. And this is also a problem that uh, a, a kind of a twin uh, thinker of Polanyi, Karl Marai, uh, dealt with, uh, with in, uh, in men and society in the Nepal Reconstruction. How it is possible to implement a, a, a a, a, a substantive, uh, man, I say, substantive rationality in order to be able to, to manage our, 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 our problem. And in fact, uh, the, the idea that uh, uh, society has to reflect on itself is a, 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 a further level of complexity uh, uh, making society more complex uh, for the, the very fact that it, it has to, um, inside the society, there has to be also the possibility to reflect about itself. Okay, I'm going to be like Terry. Um, okay, so um, thank you very much. The, the next speaker is Alicia. Is that right? Thank you, Terry, uh, for the invitation to be here with you. And uh, I'd like to confess that uh, uh, we had a uh, marvelous time when Terry went to the School of Economics in Mexico City last February. And we, uh, we told her that we will be with her. And so we are here. And I also want to tell you that we have uh, reread several times the Great Transformation. And in the post economic program, uh, we read it uh, around 10 years ago with our students. And then last year, we read it again. And we also read the book of Carrie Plunge. So um, as Michael said, uh, every time you read, you have new ideas. And you have more ideas that Polanyi gave you. So it's really a very hard work, because we will never finish <laughs> uh, 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 trying to understand uh, the world that we are living today. So the paper, uh, well, the paper uh, that it is in the USB, it is a draft paper, and it's almost finished. I almost finished this morning, and I have changed several times uh, how it is. Uh, so I don't know when it will be finished, but the, um, the title that I put it here is Democracy, Austerity, and Financialization, and it is related with a monetary production economy during the post-crisis period. So um, these, two, uh, these two books uh, give us a lot of ideas, and, it, uh, and especially how uh, those society works. So um, we read it, and, uh, and I will take from the Great Transformation one of the things that I think it is very important how we can relate uh, a monetary production with democracy, austerity, and freedom. So uh, one of the things that Polanyi says in the first in, and in the second chapter is uh, the importance of the uh, regulate markets. 
when we have, if we have a monetary economy production, markets must be regulated, and this gives us the opportunity to have democracy and also the freedom of, of society. Freedom in society, and also one of the things that he is in, 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 in several chapters, he used uh, <coughs> ethics, he used also happiness, and of course freedom. So it is very important when we have regulated markets and uh, money uh, uh, is not only money as butter, uh, it is money uh, as a credit in, in a credit function, give us opportunity to have development and to have a better distribution of income. So what happened, and this is uh, I think one of the best clues that I found in the Great Transformation and also in the book of Kari Polanyi is the legacy of these thoughts. So when uh, we have the self-regulated markets, when the markets, when we deregulate and liberalize not only the financial system but the economic system, then all the interchange relations are um, out of control. So we have problems in this monetary economic production and one of the worst things that happened is that we had problems with the regime, with the, the, the democracy, with democracy as a democratic regime. Also, what are the alternatives when we have this uh, mess in the interchange relations and in the monetary economic production is that uh, came a lot of austerity policies. And these austerity policies change everything and so it is a very complex situation between the macroeconomic and the microeconomics. And the austerity uh, policies are especially in this part that um, unifies the macro with the microeconomics and these austerity policies respond to the capital venture as Keynes had, um, defines in the uh, 24 chapters of uh, the theory of, um, of employment. Well, uh, I will take, I, I will cite uh, Par Parges. He says, this ideology is an austerity doctrine imposed just like the Inquisition on all governments and its experts who have revolutionized the hegemonic thought by appropriating the principles of the market in what refers to the social <coughs> life of individuals. So uh, austerity is the worst thing that we have done and we, uh, one of the examples is the situation that we are having in, in Europe and in most of the countries. Well, maybe right now Europe is like the uh, best example of this of the, how they, they have implemented the austerity problems, but since the 70s, when we have a lot of recurrent crisis, especially in the um, underdeveloped countries, we have experimented all these austerity programs imposed by the International Monetary Fund. So uh, this recurrent crisis, of course, the iceberg of all of this is a crisis uh, of 2000, 2007. Well, what is, what is happening is, is that the modern economic theory, the uh, hegemonic thought is uh, out of control. It is uh, wrong, but the people that are especially in the central bank, in the central bank of Europe, in the <coughs> European Central Bank, in the Federal Reserve, in all the central banks has the chip of the austerity to resolve the economic problems. So what happened with the economic cycle? Well, that there's a real problem because the alternative policies that they have in, uh, uh, imposed, the only thing is that they have reduced uh, in a very severe ways the, uh, um, the, the growth of the economy. So. I like this one. This is one of the, uh, the economists, the parents of falling inflation. Uh, it is incredible how all the uh, austerity programs 
always wants to control inflation. When we signed, when Mexico signed the um, NAFTA agreement, we just we have to uh, reduce the inflation uh, target less than uh, two points, less than ten um, percent, uh, zero inflation. So we have zero uh, growth, and uh, there's um, Christine Lagarde trying to to recover the economy, but. She just doesn't. She just can't do anything because she's really she's really very uh, uh, preoccupied. Even she has uh, said in uh, she in, in one of the uh, discourse that uh, she gave last year, she said that it was very important that uh, the um, women uh, do more work go to the formal economy or the informal economy because this will increase growth. But uh, they haven't changed the austerity programs. Well, so the objective um, of, of these, uh, the contributions that I have found and I, and I have been trying to, to discover in the Polanyi lectures is what refers to democracy and freedom of the human beings uh, when immersed in an austerity process controlled by the interests of the rentier capital during the post-crisis period. This is very important because when Polanyi talks uh, between the period, uh, for example, when he talks when the um, go gold, um, what is it, Patron? The gold standard regime, and he said, well, nobody knew why it was so important the the, um, the 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 golden a uh, the gold uh, pat patron the gold uh, system until they thought it was the industrial regime it was the gold it was the monetary regime when it this, when it has a lot of problems that brings uh, and and it was the antecedent the um, the decrease of this uh, patron was the decrease and take the um, and set the <coughs> the period between the first and the second war. So um, that is uh, why it is very important when Polanyi talked about the importance of a monetary system and of a democratic <coughs> regime. Uh, so uh, these are uh, con con um, these contradictions are in the great transformation, and it is very important to take those. Uh, to take that reading to understand what is happening right now, especially in, in Europe and around the world. <coughs> so uh, the great recession and deflation dangerous to a point in which they are capable of altering the European democratic regime, as we are seeing. I think many people is very preoccupied about what is happening in Europe because there are a lot of movements that um, that are uh, 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 dangerous. Well, how far is the limit of the post-crisis period and how to break the rampant circle that leads, leads to situation of nationalist revival, homophobia, and dignity loss? Well, this is the last, uh, last month. This was the, the draw that is about debt, and it says we are trapped in a cycle of the credit booms. So it's really, really very preoccupying that situation. And I want to finish that when we have all these austerity measures and that uh, relations, that deep relations with the macro and micro is that we have uh, to understand that this uh, is answering to the financialization uh, process. Um, and when we have all these austerity measures, well, there's <laughs> the austerity, it, it impacts a lot in employment, and employment is reduced a lot. So uh, we are having terrible problems, and of course, we have to reread again and again uh, not only the Great Transformation, but also the book of Kari Polenci. Thank you very much. Thank you. And
our final uh, speaker is Sydney Greenfield. Can I keep this down here until I'm ready? Thank you. Uh, I was a student of Carl Flanagan's, about which I will be talking at lunch tomorrow. So this is an advertisement. <laughs> but I'm not a member of the club. So what I will be talking about today has little to do with anything that has been presented thus far. This paper is about illness <coughs> and healing in Brazil. It also is about an unusual form of religious proselytizing that redeems physical well-being in addition to saving souls. Of greater importance for the purposes of this conference, the paper is about the economic arrangements that take place when Brazilians experiencing the symptoms of illness seek and obtain what will be referred to as alternative forms of treatment. Brazil has a modern system of conventional biomedicine that will not be discussed here. It operates in terms of monetary fees charged by providers for their services and paid to them in currency by those treated or their insurance companies. These arrangements conform to the principles of market economics and are not my concern. Alternative therapeutic procedures are made available in Brazil by otherworldly beings that are parts of the pantheons of a variety of competing <coughs> religious groups. The religious groupings in question are referred to in the literature as popular to oppose them to the formal Roman Catholicism with which most Brazilians still at least nominally affiliate. The case, in the case of Cardus' Spiritism, the first alternative healing system to be discussed, sick people appeal to and are treated by spirits of dead individuals who had been medical practitioners or healthcare providers from other cultural traditions in previous lifetimes. In Umbanda, another healing system described spiritual entities of historically marginalized Brazilian figures provide treatment. Money is not offered to the supernatural beings <coughs> by the patient. This is not to say that payment is not made. It is, but the transaction does not conform to market principles. What takes place between a patient and a provider from another domain in Brazil's alternative healthcare system derives from the still vibrant transaction between a petitioner in the pre-Reformation folk variant of Roman Catholicism brought to Brazil by its first settlers and a saint for the Virgin Mary. According to the assumptions of Roman Catholicism, a saint is a special individual who after death has been reborn, quote, and elevated to everlasting life in heaven by an all-powerful creator God believed to have control over all aspects of the universe, including the destinies of those on earth. Saints, continuing the quote, are considered friends of God, able to act as intermediaries with him on behalf of supplicants on earth." Unquote. Living worshipers may invoke a saint's intervention on their behalf by making an offer of exchange. But what does a poor suffering mortal have that might induce the saint to respond positively to a request? Certainly not money. What then? The answer is devotion and prayer, without which the saint would fade from living memory. Brazilian petitioners in the folk or popular Catholic tradition make promises, vows in which they offer, for example, to make a pilgrimage to the same shrine, and while there engage in ritual practices, such as going to mass, saying prayers, 
and performing acts of public penitence. When a petitioner is granted his or her request, those who see the world in scientific and secular terms call it a miracle. The completion of the petitioner's part of the exchange, the payment of his vow, is conditional and made only after he or she obtains what was asked for. Hence, the millions of pilgrims at the shrines of Brazil's many saints are there because they have already been granted the miracle they have petitioned and are fulfilling their part of the bargain. Most requests made to the saints in Brazil are for interventions to eliminate the often debilitating aches and pains of illness. This ancient practice of sick people promising to engage or re-engage for those who have ceased to participate in religious rituals in exchange for supernatural intervention is the prototype that has been incorporated by other Brazilian religious groups and is the basis for the economics of alternative healing. Sick people request help from supernatural beings, from the supernatural beings of an alternative or popular religion. In exchange for and after receiving it, they affiliate with the group, participate in its ritual practices, and publicly pay homage to the otherworldly beings they believe to have cured them. In brief, they pay for successful treatment by converting to and participating in the faith of the provider. Since this conference is, most of you are economists, I have decided that instead of describing the treatments, I will show some videos uh, of them to you, hoping that this will wake you up since it's late in the day. But first, what I want to do is read my conclusion before we turn to that. And this is the conclusion. In the classificatory rubrics of modern thought, much of what has been presented in the paper would be placed in the category of religion. Hence, the healings described are not ordinarily included in discussions of health care. They would be referred to as faith healings. The point to be stressed here is that they also are not thought of in terms of economics. The ontological framework of Brazil's alternative or traditional culture is different from that of its modern counterpart. It contains its own frames for thinking about and classifying social behaviors. The substantive approach to economics and other social institutions proposed by Karl Polanyi makes it possible to conceptualize the behaviors reported as a way to institute the production and distribution of valued resources that satisfy certain human needs and wants. If pleased with the results, the patient fulfills the bargain made by joining and participating in the ritual practices of the healing agents group. Should the otherworldly entity not provide satisfactory results, the petitioner is not obligated to affiliate or, if for a second illness, continue affiliation with the group of the provider. If the symptoms persist, negotiation with the entities of other religious groups can begin. Satisfaction obtained from any one of them will lead to the recovered patient rejoining, joining its religion something that may happen multiple times over the lifetime of the average individual. Today, Brazil's formal economy is growing, and unemployment and extreme poverty are on the decline. Conditional cash transfer programs, such as the Bolsa Familia, the family stipend, has put money and purchasing power in the hands of many of the most needy. Brazil's population also has stabilized. But endemic and infectious diseases related to bad sanitation, 
Shortages of water, insufficient electricity, and poor quality foods remain as challenges to good health, especially of those living in disadvantaged communities. As a result, large numbers continue to seek help for their ailments and the popular religions and their otherworldly beings are providing it. As people seek cures for their illnesses and other unresolved problems by making bargains of exchange in the religious marketplace, they also will change their religious affiliation and practices periodically. <laughs> this rotation and <coughs> circulation of individuals from one religious group to the next will persist as these alternative faiths intensify their competition for converts within a finite population. We have a couple more minutes. If you can help me just put that on. Uh, this is a bit of video showing Cardis's spiritus healing, in which surgeries, you will see, are performed without anesthesia and antisepsis, and the patients recover and get better. Thank you. The patient on whom surgery was performed this night was a young woman who had a growth on her right shoulder. Neither she nor anyone in her family was spiritist. She had been brought to Edson by her mother, who had heard stories about his patients not experiencing pain when he operated. Fatima became uncontrollably irrational at the thought of the possible pain she might experience should a doctor try to remove the growth surgically. She was given no drugs or sedatives by Edson or his assistants. As you can see, she did not react at all when the healer made an incision and began to remove the infected material in the shoulder with a pair of scissors. She did not flinch when his finger was introduced to tear loose the remainder of the material. As you can see, Edson does not wear gloves when he does surgery, and he will not wash his hands before turning to the next patient. In fact, he will not wash his hands until he has attended to all of the patients to be seen on a given night and comes out of trance. To the best of our knowledge, no cases of infection or other post-surgical complications have been reported thus far by any of his patients. The second woman treated this evening suffered from sinus problems and a perennially stuffed nose. To cure her, Edson will drive a pair of scissors up each of her nostrils deep into the sinus cavity to demonstrate that in spite of the apparent lack of asepsis, there will be no infection. He will ask a bystander to spit on the gauze to be wrapped around one of the pairs of scissors before driving it into the patient's sinus cavity. As you shall see, he often asks those assisting him to introduce germs and other contaminants into areas where he has made incisions. The antisepsis, he explains, is provided at the spiritual level, as is the anesthesia. <laughs> The inserted scissors do not affect the cure. Instead, Edson explains, as the case with other objects you will see inserted into the body, they direct energy from the spiritual plane that will dematerialize growths and other extraneous objects. The materials obstructing the flow of air into the patient's nostrils will be made to disappear, enabling the woman to breathe as Edson, or Fritz, puts it, as she never has before. 
In a third surgery, Edson or Fritz will remove a growth from the eye of an elderly woman. The patient, who is poor, chose the healing medium instead of a conventional doctor, not only because he charges no fee, all healing, according to Spiritus, is done as charity, but more importantly, because she is a diabetic, and like Mrs. Budenazi, was afraid she might not survive the chemical anesthesia used in hospital settings by conventional doctors. While snipping at the film growing over the eye, the healer will stop to explain that this procedure usually takes between 30 and 40 minutes when it is done in a hospital. He, however, will do it in about 25 seconds. The next two patients, one with back problems and the other suffering from agonies, were treated with needles. For the first patient, who tried to show any sleight of hand or anything, and the point is to indicate, really, that other worlds are possible if we look at it and require explanations other than the conventional ones, in this case provided by the medical establishment, which is totally baffling. And what we're talking about, really, is looking at other finding of the paradigms that resolve what are anomalies, and I use this as the example to say, this is the kind of thing we can do in the economic world, but it requires the kind of imagination that anthropologists learn when they see the world through other people's cultural eyes. So now we can do that. but not too much time, so I urge you to limit your questions to either surgical techniques or the details of the Spinemann system. Uh, anything else will be declared out of order. freedom do we actually have? It seems to me that the views that have been presented is that capitalism, as we now see it, has managed to survive in terrible condition, but yet has resisted attempts to reform. So how does one deal with that? It seems to me that the last example, unfortunately, is metaphorically a comment on this system, namely that although it's possible to have esoteric solutions to problems, there's hardly the mainstay of a major system. We know that people, even particularly psychiatrists in our system, use this kind of approach based on faith or belief, but with medicine hardly depends on placebo effect for its total efficacy. And it seems to me that the suggestion is being made here, even if we grant the fact that these cures have taken place, surely that's not the basis of a new system of, med of medicine for all. So it raises the question, yes, it's possible to have very successful economic experiments on a small scale in various places, depending on the conditions of the place and the time. But we're dealing supposedly with an effort to transform major economic systems and how much freedom do we have to make these changes when capitalism has managed to resist reforms and yet survive for the benefit of the few. Thank you. Okay, we're going to take a, a bunch of questions. And then, um... Hi, uh, Walt Kendall. Um, 
This was fascinating until you drove me out of the room. <laughs> um, but that's my limitation. Nothing wrong with me. Uh, a quick comment about um, Amitai Sen. I think I heard the first mention of his name in the conference, and I think it's a name that needs to be put into the mix, particularly with his emphasis on capability rather than disability. Um, on the Anthropocene, uh, you folks, Peter and John, you left, you identified the war as one of the uh, targets, the enemy, the trouble, the cause of all the bad thinking. And when you listed the disciplines that needed to be attended to uh, on the right-hand side of the list, you left the law out, and it needs a lot of nurture if it's going to be brought back to its dignity, so please put it back on the list and help us out. It's in there. It's one of our orphans. I, I understand you put it's it on the negative side. Orphans, by the way. But it's not on the right-hand side of your list of all the disciplines which starts with philosophy. So just to give you some problems. Thank you. Myron Frankman, a uh, quick question about uh, education for the Anthropocene. Uh, I'm just wondering why you put uh, give pride of place to economics in your in your label. Uh, I think that's a great part of the problem, and it seems to me that it should be not given pride of place at, at uh, a kind of introductory level and maybe not even at the undergraduate or certainly not in high school. Uh, it's, uh, anyway, that's why. Hi, I'm Ann Withorn. I grew up in the fundamentalist South. I've got uncles that are lay Baptist preachers and do faith healing and foot washing. And the, the experience of that for 10 years with people doing various versions of that, and usually much worse because they were telling us on Easter morning about the terrible things that the Jews did to God. Oh, that was Jesus, sorry. Uh, and uh, living in a world now where people get very, very harmed by something that it, it moves other people, but it doesn't move me. And all I can see about the evidence of history is that all of that non-provable stuff around what God can do or gods can do or spirits can do just gets us totally off track from doing what we think we can do as human beings without asking other people to look at sticking, thing, sticking things up other people's nose. I, 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 I understand that people do that and I think I had my heart chest when I walked in to have my chest cut open in order for them to do open heart surgery I thought I'm walking in doing this. I'm trusting that these doctors can do something which I can't imagine that they could do and they say I'm going to be okay. And you know, I understand that some of the things that humans do in the name of curing each other is hard to hard to understand, but I really feel, I mean from this guy we call Pope, but his name is Jorge Bagoglio and he's got a really big job and he's doing a good job with it. But I really, as a secularist and a person who doesn't think a pope is more than a king, and there's not many kings I want to call king, I, I think we have to really think about a world that we can say we're in. Now I know other people don't agree with that, but I really want to feel like in a, a place where we're talking about humanism and values and ethics as well as economics and social science, that we don't have to be I mean, my, we, if you want to go to my uncle's and get your feet washed, actually they're dead. They'd have to be their dead bodies to do it. But really, I, I'm offended by this, just like I'm offended by people saying it's God's will that we did this, or it was one of those things. God, it must God must have had a reason. All the God stuff and the God's stuff that's out there. Can't we have some places where we don't have to do that? except as some cultural historical things that people do when they're having culture. I, I really am offended, and I don't think we need it. Now, if other people do, that's fine, but I, I didn't come here for that. Thank you. <laughs> one more. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, yeah, there's one. No? I'll, I'll give you a chance. Hi. It's uh, according to the, 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 the um, things that... I'm uh, um, huh? um, Ah, okay. The, yeah, she said. Um, just that. Well, I'm an anthropologist. He also is. I mean, I'm not trying to say that it was good or not to see this, but it's just another perspective. And uh, these things exist. I think that exist. It's in their minds. I don't know. 
but um, also we I think that um, we should be able to respect that things that exist there and also if he thinks that it was part of his research or not I don't know um, I don't know I mean, also for me the pictures were like no um, but um, and I think that we need to have in mind that these are not that's another word I mean Brazil even Latin America we are now in Canada there's culture is completely different. Thank you. <laughs> okay, I'm going to um, give the floor to Peter and John to respond first. So, uh, just to uh, Myron Franklin's question about privileging <laughs> economics. Yeah, it's a problem. Um, we, um, we, we also deal with um, the other dis uh, orphan disciplines at, at length in the program. Um, so e economics is one, finance, law, governance, ethics. Probably all the social sciences, in one way or another, are candidates for being orphans because they they have a sharp ontological division between nature and man, between nature and humanity, and this this leads to all kinds of convoluted, inward-looking conversations. Um, so we're really trying to take on a lot more. We I don't especially like the title, to tell you the truth, for the reasons you just gave, but um, that's the one we, we, because we are grounded in ecological economics, we needed to, thought we needed to provide a focus, but we added a subtitle, which we, which we didn't put up on the screen, called the Regrounding the Human-Earth Relationship with Humans in Lowercase and Earth in Uppercase, um, to signify that, you know, a whole new ontology is needed. Does that cover you, John? Okay, Sydney, or? Okay. <coughs> I do not wish to offend anyone. Uh, the woman has left. I can't even apologize to us. But this is a scholarly conference, and we present the facts, and we have to deal with the facts. I don't like to publicize myself, but I would suggest anyone's interested. I wrote a book called Spirits with Scalpels, the cultural biology of religious healing in Brazil. And what that is, is an attempt to break down the paradigm of modern medicine and show that if we look at some of the alternatives, like this as one example, we can reconstruct a medical paradigm that's larger than the one we have which includes, among other things, something you may all be familiar with, and that's hypnosis and hypnotherapy, and the whole notion of altered states of consciousness, and the relationship between the information that we convey to our bodies, which we do chemically through pharmaceuticals, can be done symbolically and in other ways, and use this to heal people. But if we jump up in the air and say, my God, everything that's different from what we're familiar with, we can go no place because we can't criticize what we do. And as I say metaphorically, I presented this to say that this is what we have to do in economics instead of just talking about poverty and coming out of it from our own cultural perspective, it is by looking at other possibilities and imagining other possibilities. I say tomorrow, this is what I learned from Carl Polanyi when he was doing economic anthropology. And this is what I would like to add back into the mix here. Okay, that's enough. concerning ourselves today, and it is uh, uh, the problem of, uh, of restoring uh, society's freedom of creative adjustment. Well, this, this is 
is being what we say. And this is a, the, the, a big and terrible problem because this starts from uh, uh, the fact that when uh, Polanyi uh, describes the creation of, the, of a radically new type of society, uh, grounded on the, uh, based on, uh, on the, the commodification of uh, labor and, and land. He says, a new integration of men and nature was unsuccessfully attempted. Uh, uh, the, the problem uh, is open from the beginning and now is, a, is a less uh, <laughs> closed than, than ever. And paradoxically, uh, the more we, 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 we would need to, to solve this problem, and the more it becomes difficult to, uh, to, to face it. And probably something can be changed in, in, in better, and probably the, pro the problem is not simply capitalism, but I don't know, mm -hmm. the man, the natural man, the, no, our, our, our <laughs> the, 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 the brain of the snake, of the snakes uh, still uh, being inside our, our brain, but, uh, but in, anyway, the, it's a terrible problem that uh, nobody knows how to solve it. In any case, uh, at least uh, uh, at the cost of being a little neurotic, we can uh, at least uh, uh, be uh, acknowledge that the problem is a radical one and has to do with the structure of a, a, a completely original and specific. Uh, type of society, form of society, social uh, organization, and we cannot forget this level of, of, of problems. Alisa, did you want to? No, it's okay. Okay, Peter, you wanted to? I just wanted to take a response to Sam's question, but take it in a little bit different direction. I'm trying to throw down a pretty dramatic challenge to political liberalism and to market liberalism by pointing out that if you put the laws of thermodynamics and the golden rule on the same page, you've got big problems, right? Because there are no such things as, or very, very few such things as self, <clears throat> solely self-regarding acts. Um, and this is particularly true in the Anthropocene once this carbon sink is full, which it is, and when we're heavily dependent upon use of fossil fuels to support the cheap food system. Um, so I think a really thorough re-examination of the moral and conceptual foundations of both economic and political liberalism are essential. Well, I think this has been a particularly provocative panel, and uh, <laughs> we should give all the presenters a big round of applause.